Right, I'll jump across onto Facebook just to verify that we're live. Um, I'm here. And it should pop up any second. Yep, we're up to see live now. All right, then. So, welcome to this week's edition of the Sanctuary Sports sponsored Soul Meets, where today's guest is none other than Lee Howie. Lee Howie. Lee Howie. <laughs> Before I go, Hi, everybody. I'm Dead Z. All right, Matt. Uh, before I go into the full introduction, I want to remind those at home, um, you'll be given an opportunity to win a signed copy of Lee's coveted book, Massively Violent and Decidedly Average. So please listen out for the question at the end of the broadcast. Okay, to the introduction. This is the bit that normally bores people, Lee, so just bear with me. Um, how he started his footballing career as an apprentice at Ipswich Town FC, signing for then manager Bobby Ferguson. It was there he would first meet England's stalwart Terry Butcher. He sustained a few injuries with the Tractor Boys, having his cartilage removed and being told he'd never play again. A short time away from the game saw some recovery and Lee would go on to have a successful stint with the Heed, for those uh, in America, um, that's Gated FC, uh, before being catapulted into Europe where he was picked up by Belgian team, now bear with me here, AS, is it Hemptamine? A hemp time? Hem hemptine. Hemptine, that's Le yeah. Leon's Sportive Hem Team, right? I got yeah. that right or not? Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. He'd finished league top scorer during the 88 89 season with 29 goals and helped them to promotion in 1990. Success on the field brought rumors that the then owners were looking to build a team around the big lad. That being said, how he would later leave the cl club under a cloud. We'll talk about that later. Heading home to kickstart his career. From CM Red Star to the two blues that is Bishop Auckland. How he would play his train in the local amateur leagues until the aforementioned Terry Butcher came knocking on his door in March of 1993, where he would sign for Sunland. How he had made it. He debuted against Portsmouth at Roker Park on May 1st, 1993, coming on for Sean Cunnington in, in this 4 1 win. His first full season at Sunland brought four goals and 20 appearances. Mick Buxton would later replace Butcher, and Lee's time on the field looked finished. Playing time was cut, and Buxton had just brought in Brett Angel from Everton. How he would fight for his position, but it wasn't until Peter Reid joined uh, Sunderland, uh, sorry, that the Sunderland native would make his biggest impact. He played in 30 games over the 95-96 championship winning season. His late equaliser at Fratton Park to secure a 2 all draw with Portsmouth in February of 96 proved to be crucial turn of point this season, as it set Sunderland off on an 18-match unbeaten run that won them the league. Worth noting that his goals that year secured no fewer than seven points for the Black Cats, and an extra round berth in the League Cup. Much was his impact to the team. How his final games for his beloved Sunderland would, would come in the 96-97 top flight season as he recorded 16 appearances against England's Premier League sides. At Sunderland, Lee would play a total of 81 first team games, scoring 11, 11 goals in four full seasons. He'd moved to Burnley in 97 before joining the Cobblers of Northampton Town in 99. How he would finish his career in the lower leagues with Forest Green Rovers before hanging up his boots and Nuneaton Borough. Although primarily a forward, Howie played a central defender on many occasions during his career. He was considered to be comfortable in either role. Massively violent. Average. <laughs> <laughs> massively violent. Decidedly average. And we all know about his brother, ladies and gentlemen, Lee Howie. There you go, mate. Uh, <laughs> That's your thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. I forgot all about that. I'm glad you reminded us. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking about the other day. I was hoping that you'd go back and read your book to... Make sure you're up to speed because uh, there's a few good questions in here for you today. So, so what are you up to these days, then, Lee? Uh, I've been in an industry called, well, it's just payments industry. So my company I work for now is called Trust Payments. Uh, we're actually, we've got a, an Atlanta office in the US. Uh, we've got an office in uh, London, which is next door to the Bank of England, which is the Royal Exchange. And the bank I work for as well is in Malta. So we we're very, you know, cover fair much, much of the globe so and I've been doing that really for about 18 years okay. once I finished football I didn't have a pot to piss in to be fair and I actually got on my bike and the biggest employer at the time when I lived in Northampton was uh, was Bartley Car and I actually cycled in went in the doors and went have you got any jobs <laughs> and that's 18 years ago and I, now and I'm, I'm fairly I've got a fairly high position with interest payments so yeah I've done a really good career so you know how to come to open it to borrow some money? Is that what you're saying? No, borrow money. No, it's all about <laughs> card payments, contactless oh, right. payments, mobile. So the technology be behind all that, all that payments. Okay. Good yeah. stuff. Yeah, well, let's, never come to me for money. <laughs> I'm saying now. Um, <laughs> let's, let's talk about football, Chris. So basically, you'd start off 
Um, at, obviously, it's, it's Suffolk, at, uh, Ipswich Town, before like you were offered an apprenticeship by Bobby Ferguson. So as a young player, where did you draw your inspiration from? I mean, I never, I was thinking back and I've never really had somewhere I had inspiration in terms of, oh, wow, that's me player. But the, the, the two major players that I used to really, really enjoy playing in the young years was obviously Gary Rowell at the time. You know, I was a, I was a young lad uh, and lucky enough, I've had, the, I've had the joy to meet Gary many, many times. And also Bob Lee, and much of some that everybody, big centre forward. You know, he just, you know, again, local lad. It was, uh, I, I, I just, I, I just wanted to, uh, just wanted to be them. I just wanted to play for some. But again, I think one of the, one of the big inspirations once was uh, I did actually see me dad playing a Sunday league game and knock some centre half out. That was quite inspirational. <laughs> That's brilliant. <laughs> I think I, I took out, uh, well, you mentioned about a Sunday league. I remember going out, there's a pl uh, place in uh, Rickleton in Washington called the 11, and it's basically 11 fields there. And me and my dad used to go over and watch on a, the Sunday league. And I remember a lad being sent off and then going and getting his transit van and basically driving on the field to try and run the referee over. That was uh, that was Sunday league at its best right there. Yeah. yeah. So, well, well, I, well, my dad, I think yeah, most of the time, I think he, he, spent, he spent most of the time in Sunday league suspended. So, I'm, but I'm not sure where I got the aggression from, but I'm I was just going to say, uh, pinpointed there. Absolutely, yeah. So, <laughs> I, I was just going to say, was there somebody that you admired, in, um, admired, you know, to the point that you would emulate them? But I think you've just mentioned like your dad, basically. Probably so, your dad. I, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to tell him, but yes, probably. <laughs> That's brilliant. So, as I mentioned in the intro introduction, there you received devastating news, having had your cartilage removed from your knee. I believe the PFA in Ipswich gave you a sm very small payout and sent you on your way. How did you feel when you were told that you could never play again? Well, you can imagine it's, uh, I mean, it was Professor Dandy who did the operation, who, who actually just fixed uh, Paul Gascoigne's knee, you, mm -hmm. know, you know, put a, I don't know, was it a pig's, pig's ear or a pig's tongue through his cut, through his, uh, his knee, something strange. But uh, yeah, I went to uh, a hospital in Cambridge. Uh, the guy was there, did the operation. But again, I was coming through from the other set. I was, I was, I was a bit groggy, and uh, and he gave us this, give us this news, mm -hmm. and it, and I think I dropped back off to sleep. I wasn't sure, and then when I woke up, the physio was there, and uh, did he, and, and then he just said, did uh, did the doctor obviously did the surgeon tell you what, what what's going on? And I went, no, I thought I dreamt that, <laughs> uh, and he, he went, oh, Lord. no, you you done like that's it. Mm -hmm. I was nineteen. It was. So what uh, was you yeah, it was, it was heartbreaking. And then eventually, when I got stuff, he said, "Oh, will you get a bit of insurance?" I got fifteen hundred quid. That was Good it. Lord. Yeah, yeah. And sent home, and then sent home. Yeah. But what was your motivation to continue playing? Then, like? I mean, if you were told you weren't, you, you obviously knew the risks as well. I mean, especially getting older, no cartilage, probably mm. uh, high um, uh, risk for um, arthritis and stuff like that as well. So. What was your motivation to get yourself back playing again? Well, at 19 and 20, you, that, that, them, them sort of things don't even pop into your head. You just love football and you just want to carry on playing. Uh, mm -hmm. And that was it. But I did, when I first come back, uh, I did get a, a couple of games for Blight Spartans. But once I played, every time my knee was just was just swollen. Mm -hmm. So, But the season ended and I just I just gave myself around about, about two or three months rest. Mm -hmm. uh, and then... Then it was just like, well, let's just see. Let's just see how it goes. And again, you know, playing for local leagues, you're only training once or twice a week. It's not like mm -hmm. it's a full on. So I was able, I was able to manage it. But I always, I always had the belief that if I carried on, I might get another chance. But mm -hmm. but I was footy mad, so it didn't really matter. He couldn't take football away from me. Class. So obviously you went to Gated, and then you ended up in Belgium. How did that come about? <laughs> well, I played about five games for Gated that month. I think it might have been the month of August. Uh, I scored four goals, and then we all went to the stadium after training session, and uh, and they were divvying out the uh, divvying out the money, and I signed for sixty quid a game. Uh, and when it come to me, Parnaby just said, "I'm really sorry, Lee. I've run out of money. He's a fiver." <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. I was like, "You." I, I took it. Like, you know, I did tag it. Yeah, because I thought, "Oh well." And then uh, the next year. Would you believe I got a phone call from a guy, uh, Kenny Ellis, who was uh, a player over there for years and years, uh, and he just went, uh, I'm taking a few lads over for a trial. Do you, do you fancy coming? 
And I thought, yeah, do you know what? Yeah, well, he went, oh, I'll pick you up tomorrow at six in the morning. <laughs> so I just I just went for it. I just decided yeah. to go. Yeah. yeah. So you obviously, I, I mentioned there, like, obviously you had uh, a successful time as well over in Belgium as well. And there was, I think you were somewhat of a, a local celebrity. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, um, they'd mentioned, or there was mentioned, uh, that the then owners actually were trying to build a team around you at one stage that they were looking to bring in other lads that you were the catalyst for this um you know development in that which was quite, quite a small club uh, and, and basically they wouldn't use you as the as the, the pinnacle for moving the club forward is that is that true yeah i mean when, when we went over for this trial game uh there was uh, another lad who was at ipswich with us uh and he was obviously played for the kid set as well a lad called danny olson and he had a great game. I mean, he had a great game in the trial. I mean, I was set forward and I only got a kick. And when it came to the negotiations and stuff, they really wanted Danny rather than they wanted me. But I, I, again, I was like, uh, I, I was a part of the deal uh, mm -hmm. and they took me. And then when we went to come over to start, the, start that season in September, Danny didn't go. So I think when I turned up myself, I think they were a bit disappointed. <laughs> but uh, I scored 11 and 11. Yeah. Uh, when I went over and and again, that league, that league itself never seen any any big centre forward like me. It was all like pretty football, pass it at the back, and I was going around smashing centre halves and nodding loading. Uh, so yeah, so and that was their first professional. But when I when I first played that game, we played in Namur Stadium, which is around about the fifth biggest city in uh, Belgium, which was nice. Didn't realise who I'd signed for. Went out. It's about twenty miles outside Namur, and it was just a farmer's field. Honestly, it was a farmer's field. It was just, uh, I think they had around about 400 people that lived there. Good Lord. <laughs> yeah, but he, but he had plenty of money. He had a, a, an industry there. Uh, I think it was something like tarmac or something he, he did. But he had plenty of money. And his mm -hmm. goal was then obviously to get, get that team, that village team, into their national league. And, and that's mm -hmm. what he wanted to do. And, and to be fair, he, he ended up doing it. Yeah. Well, you, again, uh, we can talk a bit now about your uh, departure. Um, as I said before, from what I've read, they were looking to build a team around and then all of a sudden you were out of there. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? What happened? No, I mean, again, I think sometimes the, the setup was absolutely perfect. We had young lads uh, who had grew up within the team. We, 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 we'd integrated a few other semi-professionals as well in the team and every, we were virtually like a family. It was great. And then, then again, he want, the, the, uh, the chairman wanted to make that step up. Uh, so then he got like this well-known manager who then brought in journeyman, really. It, it sounds like in some of them yeah, many years ago, just, just journeyman. Sorry, just turned for, uh, I just turned up for money. And, and then my goals dried up. I wasn't really... Yeah, as I said, I wasn't, I wasn't firing all cylinders. And before I know, knew it, I was out of the team. Mm -hmm. uh, then I had a big fallout. I call him a fat bastard. And he was a fat <laughs> bastard. And uh, before, and, and then the next thing I know, I get a letter saying I'm sacked. I think so. I can understand why he got the letter rather than telling you to your face. Like, <laughs> <laughs> especially if he was a big fat bastard, he'd, he'd probably say, <laughs> <been all right. laughs> Well, I think, I mean, again, you look at that and it, opportunity still not. He came home uh, and then you went to same Red Star and then you moved on to Bishop Auckland. And like I mentioned before, that's where, you know, Terry Butcher came knocking. So how did Sunderland actually get in touch with you? You know, how did, and how did he secure a contract and stuff with, with uh, well, maybe some of the Some of the guys are not, who were listening in, the, uh, then it was before Bossman. The Bossman uh, legal, mm. legal, uh, legal hearing where what went on where ES Hemting could keep my registration indefinitely. Mm -hmm. so, so once I came back, I actually couldn't play for anybody. Uh, but the, the, the PFA actually sorted something out for us where I was allowed to play non-contract football. So that took okay. over a year, just, just about, well, about a year. And then I got to play for CM and then Bishop Auckland. But mm -hmm. uh, it just, it's just one of them sometimes where right place, right time, the stars aligned. Mm -hmm. uh, Teddy Butcher was at Sunderland. Uh, then uh, Malcolm Crosby got got uh, got sucked. Unfortunately, nice guy, but obviously then Butchers Butchers the manager. His mm -hmm. assistant's Bobby Ferguson. Uh, he's got the backroom staff and some of the coaching guys is John Crothers. Everybody that was there when I was at Ipswich. 
Mm-hmm. And I remember telling me, mate, I went, if I get an opportunity, if somebody comes, I'll play for someone. And he was like, yeah, yeah, right. Well, I just knew I'd get a chance. And, and that's what happened. I was playing uh, for Bishop Auckland against Durham in the FA Cup, scored a hat-trick. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and then John Crothers said, come, come to Southern. But mm-hmm. I, I just said to him, be fair, I actually went to Ipswich first. Scored probably one of my best goals. And they wanted to sign us. Mm-hmm. But I spoke with uh, John Lyle then and just went, look, I've got a chance to play for Sunderland. It's at Roger Park. It's mm-hmm. against the Mags. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm playing in it. I said, yeah. I'll, give you, I'll give you a ring afterwards. And mm-hmm. that's what I did. I, 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 I turned up. It was a, it was a, it was a good, good mag side at the time. Some, some good players in there. We had, a, we had a good squad as well. I think it was about eight to 10,000 people turned up. Uh, we battered them. We battered them. I, I got the first. We won 4-1. Uh, mm-hmm. And then Tony Butcher just went, I want you to sign. Didn't even, didn't even hear him what he said. I just said yes. <laughs> Get in. <laughs> <laughs> and when I worked it out, it was actually less money than I was getting playing for my football teams and working for BT. But hey, it was the dream. It was the dream. Fantastic. I think that, that uh, Newcastle game, um, like Bjorn Christensen was playing for Newcastle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Nielsen, uh, O'Brien. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they had, yeah. They, they, they had, uh, as I said, they had some. some was a decent player. Man. Uh, and to be fair, we had a, we had a decent team. I think uh, uh, Craig Russell was playing. Yeah, well. Greg Russell, myself. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I think Warren Hawke was there. I think I think I think even mm-hmm. Gordon might have played. Gordon Armstrong might have played in that game. Good lord, I remember that. But uh, so, did you find the transition from like non-league football to professional football difficult when you were coming back in? Not the football side of it. The football side of it again. It, it doesn't really matter once you get between the, the lines you get on the pitch you're playing football and you can get stuck in and you can have mm-hmm. it was it was when I wasn't when I was in and around the lads it only been like a week or two weeks I was at Roper Park you know shouting and screaming and being, being a fan mm-hmm. uh, that that was the strange you know just you know talking to Don Goodman or, you know, just, <laughs> you know stood next to Gordon Armstrong or uh, you just you're just thinking Shit, you know, all of a sudden these these are these are my teammates. I'm, I'm meant to be I'm meant to be one of them, and I, that was hard. That was hard to be, and that took me a little while. That took me to the following season to really integrate, really, because I still found myself as a fan. Mm-hmm. That might have had its benefits, though, Lee. I would have thought, because I mean, you would be playing with uh, certainly passion. Uh, well, I know you remembered for that anyway, but I mean, that would have I'm sure that would have ele- elevated the game anyway, being. A Sunderland fan and then representing your hometown team. No, I pissed the lads off. <laughs> Did it? Why is that like? <laughs> if you that season, you know, we were talking mm-hmm. about when I made my debut and stuff, we yeah. uh and, and, and the Terry Butcher thing as well. So all right. We we just scraped, if you remember, we just scraped. There was about seven teams could have went down that season. Mm-hmm. And uh we got beat off Notts County 3-0. And it was horrendous. Fans were fighting each other in the stands and stuff. And then I was trying to listen to the radio anyway. We survived and Butch was a nightmare that day. And I was furious. And eventually I, I was helping with the skips and I wasn't involved in, in the game. But I was, you know, I was down as part of the squad and I was getting the skips in and helping. And I could just see the lads having a few beers and just chatting away. And I went fucking ballistic. Yeah. I was calling them all and see you went tease. It was like it was like letting a fan loose of the bus. <laughs> And right, we're going, oh, sure shut up, man, sit down. <laughs> <laughs> and eventually you've just got to get a grip of yourself, you know, the professionals. And, but just, I just just was, you know, just a fan, just a fan, let loose. All right, that's fair enough. My dad's just uh, come on here as well. He just he just said, I'll read Lee. And then he said, when you get your new house, if you want any renovations done, just give him a shout because he's got nothing to do. <laughs> I will he do if I need it. That. He'll offer, right. but then when he comes and does it for you, He'll whine all the way through doing it, and that is just how he is. You know, I mean, we were talking about this the other day. He loves it, man. Anyway, so you mentioned before you made your debut, hometown club, age of 24. You came on for Sean Cunnington, and that we mentioned at the start there, and the 4 1 victory over Portsmouth at Roger Park. There was 21 and a half thousand people there that day. What was it like for you to make your debut for your hometown club? And do you have any memories that you can share with us of that day? Yeah, I mean, it's everything you've dreamed of. You know, you, 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 Butch come to us, I think, on the uh, on the Thursday. Says I'll be involved, I'll be sub. Uh, so just thinking, please, please get on, get on. And then obviously the, the way the game panned out, I think they end up getting two sent off. 
uh, and, and, and then I got on. And all I remember was, I think I got on maybe, I don't know, I thought it was six or eight minutes. It felt like about 30 seconds. <laughs> but all I dreamt about all my life was being able to be on Roker Park and I just clapped the fans. Mm-hmm. I think it went dark by the time I got off the pitch. I just couldn't <laughs> couldn't get us off the pitch. All I wanted to do was just go around and just keep clapping. But uh, yeah, I mean, again, it's 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 everybody who's probably listening and you know, people say, "What's what's it feel like? What's it feel like?" And I always flip it again. Well, how would you feel if you somebody said to you, "On you yeah. go, son." It's just it's just it just it just blows your mind. I'm still waiting for my call up. Like, just yeah, it's, it's never too late, Dexy. Never too I, late. I might get a game. Like, I might get a game <laughs> these days. You never know. So, well, your first goal for the club came in October '93. It was the winner against Terry Cooper's Birmingham City at Roger Park. How did it feel to score your first goal? And can you talk us through the goal itself? Like it was yesterday. I don't remember. And and again, the game. If some people don't. The game is when uh, Casey broke his leg and paddled off on the stretcher. Yes. Uh, <laughs> I just remember just running in the channel a little bit and, and, and actually Casey's played it in. Uh, and I'm about 30 yards from goal. I've just let it run through my legs. And then I've just 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 a little bit of a sidestep onto my left foot, which is not which is definitely my swinger. And I've just given it a bit of a swing and it's curled and bent and gone and, and, and gone near enough in the top corner. Mm-hmm. Uh, was, it was a pretty goal. I would have said oh, you both when you would transition the ball there, I thought you were falling over it like. Rather Fuck than off. using skill. <laughs> I've been watching him back. There's a lad actually, um, it's Sunderland FC TV on YouTube. He's actually compiled, he does all sorts of stuff on there. Uh, yeah. that I often go back and look at things on there. And he's he's basically got a compilation of your top ten goals. And obviously you only scored eleven, so I'm thinking the other one must have been really shite if you didn't get in the top ten. I, mean, I would have just done a top eleven because it would have been easier. But uh um No, there was I actually I went up played against Bristol City. I scored yeah. the two worst goals you'd ever see. <laughs> one was from about an inch out that it we stood, and one was a Gordon, Gordon Armstrong shot that had virtually hit me shin and shin pad and flew in the flew in. I didn't knew nothing about it. <laughs> best brace of my life. Yeah, the best ones, man. I'm trying to think who you, yeah. who you scored those goals against. Was it was it Preston? Oh, we'll talk about your best goals later on, but there's two goals that you scored that I thought were superb. But yeah, we'll yeah. I, I, yeah, I got a left foot and a right foot. Mm-hmm. And I tried to claim the third, but they wouldn't give us it. <laughs> Shame. Right, so over, your, over your career, uh, you played for Bobby Ferguson, John Duncan, Dave Parnaby, Fernand Brabant. Well, I'll try that. That's a fat bastard. Aye. That's a fat bastard. <laughs> Terry Butcher, Mick Buxton, another fat bastard. Uh, Peter Reid, <laughs> Chris Waddle, Stan Turner, and Ian Atkins, Kevin Wilson, and Steve Burr. I'm sure you had uh, many different relationships with them. Who was the best manager you played under? And what set them aside from the others? Well, really, when he come in, but again, I think really gets you know everybody talks about really, but it wasn't just really; it was Sacco as well. Mm-hmm. That combo between the two of them uh, really was your you know your footballer who I knew World World Cup player, you know, won everything with uh, with Everton. Ultimate respect, uh, and he come in with a real you know this is it, lads. This is a desire. But then Sacco on the train and failed so just made it full. Just made it. We went from we went from the dire training of Mick Buxton to every day was absolutely painful training. I mean, it was horrendous. We hated the training. To go into the football ground, which you would you believe? I mean, we love football. We hated going in with yeah. with, uh, with Mick Buxton. It was dreadful. Uh, but all of a sudden. It became joyous again. It became fun. Mm. It, it, the, the training ground, we, we all turned up early and went away late. It was, was one of them where we just didn't want to be away. And that was the difference. And then because of that, we just we just we bonded. We, we we got closer as a team. And when you when I looked around that team as well, it's full of local lads. And all mm. we wanted to do was was just was just do well for the for the football club. And it was great, mm. it was great times, really, really great times. I think you, you mentioned there, you can actually see that in the way you were playing football as well. We actually screened the uh, Man United uh, game, the FA Cup game away at Old Trafford just before mm. uh, the talking. And I, I posted a comment there. I, I can't remember the last time I saw us play such like aggressive, uh, you know, full on. It was it was a unified team. They were playing as a, t- as a unit and they moved the ball around so well and worked hard for each other. If, if someone lost the ball, another one of our players would be running back and make a tackle behind them. And there was always that... You know, it looked like a lot of uh, cohesion, unity between the team, which was just nice to see. And I think we've missed that as of late. So, but I'm going to talk about 
a, a bad part in, in your tenure here. So I want to talk about Terry Butcher. Um, obviously, I mean, I remember him from the 90 World Cup, you know, with his head bandage up singing, let's, yeah. all have a dis- let's all have a disco and stuff like that. When he came to the club, we were super ecstatic about him coming in. And then obviously things changed. Uh, Buxton's out and they appoint uh, Butcher as manager. Things went sour pretty quickly for him. So in your opinion, wh- where did it all go wrong? I mean, you knew him from, or you knew of him from back at the Ipswich days. And obviously he signed you at the club. Yeah. Where did it all go wrong from then, do you think? I mean, it, Butch was player was was a player under Crosby, and then mm-hmm. uh, obviously before Malcolm got the sack, and, and then Terry took over. I mean, and I, I'm good friends with Terry. Obviously, known him since Ipswich days and stuff. Like that, but mm-hmm. the worst thing he said, and and it was 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 paramount. His man management skills were horrendous. Mm-hmm. He alienated virtually straight away Gordon Armstrong and and uh, Gary Hours. And not only did he only want them in the train, so, but then he picked them. And not only that, he picked himself. And at the time, he wasn't playing very well. And he just set himself up. And all of us, it wasn't long before the lads just lost complete respect for him. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that was the worst. And the pre-season training was, was the worst I've ever had. It was, mm-hmm. he was killing us. And then there was, uh, we had, it just before he got sacked, uh, there was like quite a bit of snore and we couldn't really train. So he was just sending us on runs and the lads were just getting pissed off. And I remember one run, he took us off and we were off to Whitburn. He just left us. He was freaking having a, probably a coffee in the uh, the rope calf on the top of the hill. And uh, he just sent us off for the run and us young lads, was like, you know, off we went. But like I said, Ben O, Tony Norman, Phil Gray, they, they, they got the bus. <laughs> he actually got the bus and I think, I think Ben O, Actually, all the way up the seafront from Whitburn to the seafront, got a taxi. He literally, I mean, literally got a taxi, and they just had enough. And then we came in the next day, and then we found out he'd been sacked. Yeah. So, and that was it. And do you know what? There wasn't many that 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 were was were sad about that, which yeah. which is odd because again, as a player and as a man, he was he was different class, but as a manager, he was shit. Yeah, I wonder how why people do that. You know, I mean, all the shit. transition. You've got a. It's almost like the Jekyll and Hyde situation. You know, he's, he was such a to me. An influential player and leader on the field, and then it, I, I, it just all fell by the wayside. But anyway, so speaking of playing on the field, you obviously played in, in two different positions, primarily for Sunderland, uh, striker and a central defender. Which did you prefer playing in, and why? Well, strange enough, when I when I was a kid and all the way through, really until I did the transition I, before I said, probably five side from Sunderland, I was quite prolific. I loved scoring goals. I was I was a good centre forward. Uh, but again, I think the injury as well took a toll. Me, me knee actually, when it, when it did mend, mend it, it fixed bent. It was actually completely bent. Uh, so I was never as, I mean, I wasn't that very quick, but I, I did have a bit of pierce at the, in the early days when I was at Ipswich and stuff, but that just didn't happen. And as well as that, the pressure of being suddenly centre forward for a local lad for me, Sometimes was a bit too much. Sometimes the anxiety kicked in. Sometimes I, I, I could hardly freaking breathe. I was hyperventilating at times. The uh, the pressure I felt, mm-hmm. uh, especially when I started. When I was coming on sub, was maybe a bit different. But but I, I did suffer from from really really deep anxiety when when, when I played when I played the front, you know, which yeah. was which was the brilliant. But once I get to the back, I, I felt less pressure. Mm-hmm. And then I just simplified my game because I just thought, I think I'm a centre half. I just have to head it and kick it. You know what I mean? Just block <laughs> shots. Uh, so I, so I suppose I missed the score and the goal spin, but then I really enjoyed fucking kicking people. I suppose and heading it. So, so I enjoyed both. I enjoyed both. Yeah. Okay. Well, back to your goal bit there. So you, you scored 11 goals in 81 games for Sunderland. You'd have two two goal games, seven game winning goals, and we would be responsible. I'm I'm holding you personally responsible for securing 16 league points and Mm. two next round cup bursts. That's a canny return, that. So I I think we were talking about this the other day. Um, You know, we go back and look at, as I said, seven game winning goals, which were stats mad over here in the States. So so of all the goals you scored, which one or ones are your favourites? All of them. All of them. So, (laughs) (laughs) no, but there's there's, there's three standout, I suppose. So I've got my first one. So, that first goal, that feeling of mm-hmm. scoring at Roper Park and just standing there and hearing the noise and stuff, it just it even now just puts the, the hairs on the back of my neck up 
It's just unreal. It's just phenomenal. Then because it was on the telly and it was a fairly big game, the Borough goal where it just comes off and I just absolutely good header yeah. from about the penalty spot, which flies in. Mm-hmm. And that was on TV and that was that, and a lot of people remember that. And, and the one that you mentioned before, because it was just so important, we played ever so well down at Portsmouth and give away two shitty goals and we were getting beat 2-1 and there was seconds left. And the ball's just come off the corner and I've just I've just headed, headed it and it just come off the meat right in the middle. Boom. And it just went like a rocket in off the post. And that was it. And all, and all of a sudden, our team just gained belief that we would never get beaten. And as I say, we went on that unbelievable run. And before we knew it, we were promoted. Yeah, that was Unreal. superb. That Unreal. Unreal. Right. Let's get back to the European exploits then. So I've got a little small <laughs> paragraph here. You ready for this? League top scorer oh, in Belgium. League top scorer in Belgium. Vomiting before scoring a sublime penalty, then being subbed off. Promotion and relegation to and from the top flight with Sunderland. The goal that kickstarted the 18 game and beaten run. Playing Newcastle at St James's Park with no Sunderland fan. Again, when they're all memorable moments for us. What was your most memorable moment as a Sunderland player? Again, it's 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 difficult because that debut goal is mm-hmm. will just always be but to play against the Marks for Sunderland. Wow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> just even now, I just, if, in fact, if we could, if, if you could get a game off now, I'd probably strip on and play. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, that, that to me, it was, you can keep England, you can keep what you want. That to me was just, you know, the most memorable thing is running out at freaking shit St. James's Park and all the mugs being there and just sticking my chest down and going, right, let's have it. Just loved it. Loved, loved every second of that game. Your lad was playing that day, wasn't he? As well? No, he shit himself. I told him I'm playing. I told him a week before that I'll be playing because I knew I, knew I was playing. Yeah. And I said, if he, I said, if he come into anywhere near us, I'll break his fucking legs. <laughs> and he had a calf strain. Oh, did he? Oh. He did, I. <laughs> Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Blessing. I was just thinking about most memorable moments, and I, I, whose uh, idea was it to give the microphone to Mickey Gray down at Seaburn? Uh, Mickey, was, brother. Yeah. Who? <laughs> All of us. So we. Uh, oh man. He was. He was the drunkest. Well, Mickey could get drunk on three pints, <laughs> uh, and we had been drinking for for about four days by the time he got to the mic. And that well, we just cried. Well, he he got the biggest fine ever, but. Oh. It was poor kids crying and everything as he shouted, fuck them all, <laughs> fuck them all on the mic. <laughs> but, the, but the boy is as thick as the thickest man I've ever met. He is the thickest I, man I've ever met. I remember seeing Reedy's face, though, when uh, he got on the mic, man. That was, no worry, you got fine. That was something else, that. So, but um, we were gone. Yeah, we should have went. Don't be silly, Mickey. You went, I'm going to sing, fuck them all. We were all gone. Yeah, go on, Mickey. That'll be a great thing to do. <laughs> Unbelievable. So... <laughs> So what was your, what's your most memorable moment of your entire career then? I mean, we talked about something there, but your entire career. No, again, I, that, like most, the I, I, again, I, I suppose, you know, we all dream as, as kids and, you know, what would you want to do? And, and everybody thinks, oh, I'd love to play for England and put the England. For me, it was play for Sunderland against the Mags. Mm-hmm. And that was it. That's all I want to do all my life. I just, <laughs> I've, I've, I've been... I've seen them all. I was at I was at St James's Park when Gary Rowe scored his hat trick. I was at the uh, I was at the home game when uh, was the playoff for the for the playoff finals, the semi final. Couldn't get to the uh, to the St James's Park, but I was again glued to the radio. It, it just that game is just the biggest for me, the biggest game in football for, for me personally. It's just there, there isn't anything bigger, better to be involved in, and uh, and to do it, it was just. And that's it. I'll, I'll, you know, say that. I'll, I'll tell that to me. Grave is just the best thing I've ever done. So we we, we talked about your uh, forward and defensive exploits. Now, while you were at the club, I, I'm going to ask you who your your favourite uh, partners were, forward and defence. I mean, I'm just trying to think who was there at the time. So you, you had Mickey Bridges with there, uh, uh, Ned Kelly, um, Craig Russell. I'm just thinking of Tommy Niall Quinn, uh, yeah. Paul Paul Stewart. Um, yeah, Stewart. Right. Quite a few forwards there you know i mean i'm sure there's some more i've missed there john john austin was playing wing there, i think um but you had you had quite a few there with you who was your favorite forward line partnership did you have one don 
Don Goodman. Don Goodman, I forgot about him. No, Phil Gray. Ah, I Don was great off the park as well. Good, mm -hmm. good communicator, funny man. Could mm -hmm. freaking sing as well. He had it all. He was funny. Fucking <laughs> score goals. Fucking I mean, sign for a million though. quid. He had it all. He had it all. He even had a great afro. I mean, Jesus. <laughs> the, the, lad had, the lad had it all. No, Don was good. Don was quick. He understood the game. He was, uh -huh. he, again, for me, when I was playing, a lot of encouragement when I was playing. It's just starting, as I say, when I was 20 or just getting into the game. Uh, Don, Don was good. Don, I, I, I did, did. If I was playing alongside Don, I would. Uh, I mean, at times, sometimes I would switch and Phil Gray was there. Phil, mm -hmm. Phil, Phil was a bit more selfish, a bit more self centered. Uh, mm -hmm. Good lad, but obviously, mm -hmm. just when you play him against somebody, you want that partnership. But uh, yeah, Phil was very much like, well, I want to score the goals, uh, mm -hmm. which is fine. Which is what's but 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 Don as a partnership, I I, I enjoy playing with Don. No, that's cool. So, about what about defence? And so you've been alongside the likes of Annie Melville and Dickie Ord, and the likes. Who, who was who was your favourite uh, defensive partnership? Ordy. Ordy. Uh, we were roomies, and. Mm -hmm. And we knew each other inside out. We knew each other's lives. I actually, mm -hmm. no, no. Well, if some of you know Audi, I actually literally knew Audi inside and out. He was the most disgusting man <laughs> you ever ever liked. <laughs> he was fucking horrible, <laughs> but he was a funny, funny bloke. But again, he was yeah. He was from Merton. He uh, mm -hmm. and we knew, we knew, we knew what it meant to both of us, and we were really, really close. And that mm -hmm. you know, when you got shoulder to shoulder up against at the time, sometimes in the Premier League games. Mm -hmm. you, you needed that. You needed that. Like thou, thou, thou shall not pass, Joe. You know, it doesn't matter what we do. We're <laughs> going to put our body on the line. And it was great. Yeah. It was great. And, it, and when it worked, and when we kept playing sheets, so we won games. It was just the best feeling ever to give each other a big hug and and, and go and get pissed. <laughs> well, actually, Dicky Ord's name came up the other week. We had uh, Paul Stewart on here, and we yeah. um, he said that he actually thought that Dicky Ord was the best player he played alongside at Sunderland. Believe it or not, he was great. Technically, you, like. technically, yeah, oh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if you said the most average player, he'd have probably said me. Same thing. Yeah, and there you are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I would ask you now. We'll do the memorable moments, but what do you think? The what's been? Your, what was your worst moment at the club? Either like a performance or an experience. Wimbledon. When we went uh, there. Speaking to Paul Stewart. Yeah, I. Uh, even now, Dexy, I, I still yeah. get sick thinking about it. I still get anxious about it. I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night and still this this game still wakes me up. Even when I think about it, it, it the butterflies go, the anxiety kicks in. It was just horrendous. Nice. Yeah, the, the, uh, it just it just we, we again we we needed a win. We we created we had a few chances, we didn't score. They broke on us uh, mm. and then they scored and I, it was yeah it was just terrible and coming back home and realizing that i just uh, i just remember getting a phone call from from uh, from the club on the monday afternoon just just asking if his i was okay and i was like yeah just said you've just fucking destroyed the bus <laughs> but oh, she dear. fucking ripped the toilet out fucking smashed the doors i, I was I didn't even know i did it oh lord all right uh, and even now, I still, as I say, still just just makes us feel sick. I'll not bring it back up again ever. Just no, I try not to. Hey, didn't worry, <laughs> didn't worry. I do, I do myself. I, I, I kind of help myself. Must yeah. be at least once or twice a month. I, I dream about it. Unbelievable. And that just goes to show how uh, how how passionate you are about the club, our club. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you played a, played a massive well, again. We're positive side. You played a massive part in Ree's promotion winning team. Like I said before, you played thirty games. Scoring five goals. Do you have any favourite memories of that season? I mean, being part of it was good for, because it was the first time me knee never really. I mean, I was the whole time I played for Sun and I had to be on uh, these tablets called Voltaro, so they were just anti-inflammatories. They were just high, high you know, dose anti-inflammatories just, just to keep me knee down. Uh, so I was on them and I was playing, but. Normally you pick up a groin strain or you get a calf or you get a hammy or you get something. But for the first time that season, I didn't really pick up anything else. It was just management of me knee. So I was always either in the team or not. And because I played centre forward, centre half, I could do a bit of both. I was involved. So the whole season for me was the best season because not only was it successful, it was uh, obviously I played a massive part in it. 
And I, but I just remember going away. We played Stoke and got beat. And then uh, he dropped Ned. He dropped Ned and up. And he went, Lee, you're going to be playing against uh, West Brom. And I scored a header from a corner. Oof. And I remember trying to sub- celebrate with the fans and realised it was the West Brom fans. <laughs> 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 so I had to, had to really run behind the goal to get to the Southern <laughs> fans. I just didn't put it down. But it was, uh, yeah, yeah, that was, that was great. And then, but typical as a Sunderland player, what you get is you get the highs. I re- just remember going to Tramia. We were champions. We were champions mm-hmm. of being champions. We'd been on the drink. And then we get to Tramia's ground. And I'm not. I'm meant to be sub. Uh, Mel's meant to be playing with Audi at the back. And uh, but fucking Mel twat. He he was hung over, and he told the he told the gaffy had a calf strain. So I ended up playing. I ended up playing. Mm-hmm. But to be fair, I, I, I thought he had a good game. But I remember the ball. Obviously, this was his champions. This is the last game yeah. of the season. We're trying yeah. and the ball just goes out of play, runs down between the boards and the pitch. And obviously the Sunderland fans taken over probably three quarters of the ground. Mm-hmm. So, so this guy just leans across the board and stops the ball and picks it up and gives it to me. And I pick it up and he goes, Leoi. And I went, yes, man. He went, you fucking shit. <laughs> 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 and I went, thanks very much. And I took the three. Brilliant. Yeah. I lost my son, so, I lost my son and shirt that day down there. Yeah. But for right. some reason, I ended up, we ended up on the field after the game. Um, obviously, we were celebrating promotion, and I, and I have no idea why I took my shirt off. I mean, I, back then I could, but I kind of do it now. Uh, not that I'm incapable of taking my shirt off; it's just people don't want to see what's underneath it now. But uh, <laughs> and I, I think it, it, it was a last picked it up, and then she gave me a Trammy Rover shirt. I have no idea why I put it on. It was just it was a, just a ridiculous time. But I ended up meeting my cousin and that down there, Paula. I think it was a pub at the top of the street going down into the ground, and it was just absolutely slammed full of Sunderland supporters. You got there earlier, started yeah. drinking and stuff. Superb day out, though. Superb day out. Yeah. Didn't, wasn't Aldrich, did he play that day? And he was just... Oh, I did. He scored a penalty. Superb. Yeah. We, we, I think we missed a penalty. We haven't, oh, well, my God, the chances we missed that day. <laughs> but I remember my wife at the time, I actually said, uh, when we get back, we'll go for a meal. Oh, by the time I got back, it was about, about 12 o'clock at night. <laughs> As you can imagine. I, yes. I, that, that, that marriage didn't last long. <laughs> <laughs> <Good day. laughs> so, We've been getting a lot of uh, press, obviously, with the Sun Until I Die uh, Netflix series and stuff, but um, not every, not everybody's seen. <laughs> Another beer? Aye. Oh, see, I need to get one of them. Not a beer. Wife will do that for me. She's gone out. Um, She's a good Irish girl, mate. She knows the crowd. Uh, that's spot on. Um, so basically, before that, those who haven't seen it, please, it's on YouTube. Watch it. Uh, Premier Passions. Absolutely phenomenal season. What, so that was really one of the first fly on the wall documentaries, and it was it really was, global, was the one global the first one, right? Yeah, um, absolutely superb to watch. Uh, what was it like for you, though, as a player, to be involved in that? Um, we, we're hearing people they, complaining when now. Said it, yeah, when we when we first said it, we were very wary. And and bearing in mind, you've got to think of the era, which is the early nineties, and us footballers. Mm-hmm. Uh, were hedonistic, I suppose. <laughs> we 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 drank. We we did we did lots of things that we shouldn't have done. So it was very very. Uh, we were very wary, but the yeah. guys the guys were great. The guys were great. So at the times we we thought at the beginning it was quite intrusive. They were just around us all the time. Mm-hmm. But when it came to the games and stuff, you had so much to think about other than the camera. It, you, they just they were just there. They were just they just became yeah. You know, Again, something like a fly on the wall, literally. I mean, they mm-hmm. didn't really notice them. But there was times when we were at uh, Mottram Hall and it was like international break, but the, you know, we were took away just to relax, have a few beers and stuff. As you can imagine, there was a few shenanigans going on <laughs> and we would all be in the jacuzzi and we'd be all chatting about the night before and stuff like that. And then we'd just look up and there'd be a big freaking boom in the middle of us. <laughs> and we're like, fuck's sake, man. You kind of, you kind of, what are this on? And, and they went, yeah, we know it. So the footage and stuff, if you look back, you'll see this jacuzzi. There's about eight or ten lads. But you, there's a talk over. You kind of hear what, what we're saying. It's a freaking good job. It's a good job any of our wives kind of lip read. <laughs> so now you're now a published author as well. Like we mentioned before, Massively Violent, Decidedly Average was published a couple of years ago. It's received many accolades from those that have re- read it. Uh, to quote a review from club legend Gary Bennett, Lee has produced one of the best football memoirs I've read in many a year. I'm delighted he's finally found something he's good at. 
There you go. <laughs> he is like. So what was your what no, was your no, key no. what was your key driver behind no. sharing your story? Not my wife. Yeah. Who probably yeah. Beyond us, the cans. So, Degsy, you've been around footballers, and some some of the guys might have met some. We're all full of stories. Mm -hmm. We've all got stories, and especially the year that we were in, it was just it was again we were. It was just great times. It was absolutely brilliant. Again, as a young man. You know, I got a few, a few, you know, a few pens in, in my pocket. Had a decent car. You know, it was the life. You just went out. You were, you went any pub. So far, you had a few beers. You got nightclubbing. But again, really, was just like as long as you step over that line and give a hundred percent, then we're good to go. And nothing was said. Nothing was said. So it was just fantastic. So I would sit with friends. As I say, I'm, I'm, we work now. Or just just guys who, who I've met through the kids, you know, you know mums and dads at uh, the school, and we'd go out and have a few beers and we'd, we'd chat. And I, just the stories, I would be telling stories. My wife went, <laughs> "You, you want to write a book?" And I went, "Who read a book by Lee Howey?" <laughs> I just said, "Just won't happen." Mm -hmm. And she went, "But the good stories, Lee." And then, and again, I, I, I read, I read myself, and there's a few ones that I've, I've read. You know, the Traveling Man, there's a few others where they were just, again, low level guys who just travel around and play football. I thought, do you know what? I'll give it a go. And then I spoke mm -hmm. with a guy called Tony Gillen. I went to school with, and Tony's a, a journalist. And my only problem is I just never had the time to actually get it on paper. And mm -hmm. he said, Lee, if you tell us and just just, just, just tell us your story, and I'll get it down for you. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how it started. We, we, we did a, we did it, we did a chapter a week, uh, mm -hmm. and, that, and that's how it happened. It was just, uh, and I'm super out of moon now. It's you know, sometimes I go in uh, Waterstones and there it's there next to Kananar's Boog and Ibravich and Bellier and so on. You know, it's just uh, it's it's madness. It is. It's it's there. It's out. Is is there a favorite part that you like in the book? Is there something specific in there? That's captured. I mean, stories, but I think for me is yeah, everybody wants to know about the stories about what happened with Sunland and this, that, and the other. And my time with Burnley with Stan Turnant and I was just about but I think the Belgian part where I was just a 19-year-old lad and I was going around town and there were corners of the Grand Lane. I spent more time drinking than I did on the football pitch. It was just <laughs> but it was just fun and the stories. I, I mean, virtually I was just just a young lad let loose, uh, but we again we were uh, it, it was successful. I was scoring goals and stuff, and I, 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 and I, to be fair, I didn't care. I was just really I was getting a few quid and I was playing football and I was I was doing what maybe a lot of eighteen sorry nineteen twenty twenty one year old lads did. <laughs> well, you mentioned that Belgian good. part, absolutely superb. Uh, I, I mentioned to you when we uh, chatted the other day. That I read the book when it first came out and I reread it, and it was just as funny the second time around. Um, specifically, the part I enjoyed was uh, where you actually turned up the game hungover, and then uh, was, had I a, wasn't just a, hungover. I was <laughs> honestly so drunk. I was I was sick as a dog. I just the head was pounding. I, I shouldn't have been, well. I should have been anywhere near a football pitch. But uh, I was you got a point, you? I was offside 14 times in the first 30 minutes. Oh. Well, you, I heard that you scored the best penalty you've ever scored in your life. Well, I shanked it. I just went down and smashed it, sli sliced it and went in the top corner. <laughs> <laughs> Look uh, good, maybe from the sideline, but that was it. one one nil. You were subbed straight off afterwards. And yeah. Apparently, and you lay in the stand. Yeah, I lay, I lay in the dugout behind, and then once it was all over... We went all, all, all the players went in the bar and drinking. I was just laying in the corner again, drinking water. I was I was done. I was done. Good to, be Lord. to be fair, the, 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 the chairman said if you missed that penalty, you would have sucked you. Oh good. <laughs> yeah. Well look again, look where you ended up. So so you first uh with a club for four full seasons, you obviously lined up against with sorry, with some quality players. Many of them are considered legends to this day. I always do this every every week, like so these yeah. include and are not limited to Kevin Ball, Martin Smith, John Byrne, Don Goodman, Mickey Gray, Craig Russell, Dickie Ord, Gary Bennett, Paul Stewart, Darren Holloway, who's on in a couple of weeks. 
Uh, and Chrissy Walker. Shit, shit. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> he's on, on the, I think he said he was going to watch today as well. So, but, uh, who, who, was, who was the best Sunderland player that you played alongside and why? Waddler. Chrissy Waddle. In the last yeah, season was, there, was it? Yeah. He was. I mean, six games. But, I mean, he was, I think he was with us for about yeah, 10 weeks with, 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 a, with a bit of uh, training between. Uh, I think it was an international. So, but, just going in and watching him trim, just getting on the ball, and, and we all know waddle has got this like this 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 rock and this just lazy uh, weird about him. His gear is just like this. I've never seen a man ping a ball as far mm -hmm. as accurate. He can pull it down. He can dribble. He he can do the lad can do anything. And apart from that, he's a top block. I mean, yeah. like top block. One yeah. of the lads. He, you think he'd turn up to Sunderland and you know what he's doing and stuff? He'd be a bit of a bit, of, you know, a bit like you know, I'm Chris Waddle, straight mm -hmm. in, having a laugh with the lads, having a crack. Uh, mm -hmm. One is anything we do, we went out for bit. It just it was just straight in, straight in. He mm -hmm. fitted in like like a like a like a glove, and it was just it was class. And again, probably one of the reasons why I signed for Burnley, which I really shouldn't have, but 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 be, it was just because of him. I just thought he was just brilliant. Mm -hmm. That's good. So you've also along you've also played alongside the likes of uh, Gordon Cowens, Andy yeah. Payton. He he was fairly prolific in his day. Chris Woods, Mark Cooper. Who was the best overall player that you played alongside, and why? Again, just a privilege to play against some of the the, the, the names that you read out. Mm -hmm. You would like to pinch yourself, you know. What I mean, just again flipping it over to to, to to everybody that's listening. You, you just think that is just. What dreams are made of just to think that you're playing against these guys, you know, England internationals, uh, you know, world class players. I mean, in terms of Mark Cooper and stuff, I mean, he, he, Tony Cooper's dad played for England. It, just and to talk to them and, and, and think that they're mates now, but again, just going back, Chrissy was just was just awesome. It was just mm -hmm. off the scale awesome. Mm -hmm. I think last week we, we were talking, uh, or two weeks ago, so we were talking about Gaza. You know, with uh, Paul Stewart, and he said yeah. again, same sort of thing, just unbelievable. Like, um, and actually, Gordon Armstrong mentioned him as well. So, all right, here we are then. So, having a reputation, I want to ask you two uh, another question as well, along with this. Having a reputation <laughs> of being ma being massively violent yourself, and I put on there. By the way, David Kolu sends his Kulu, best wishes. No, Kulu Kulu. Sends his, yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, again, those who don't know, you have to read the book and find out about that. Uh, <laughs> Who was the hardest player you played with and why? And I put in parentheses here, Mick Harford, comma, Borley, question mark. That was that was the, uh, that, that was just two, right? So I know you yeah. had those two, two lads at that club, but who was the hardest player that you played alongside? Well, I, I, I knew loads of stories about Mick. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a local lad and I knew Mick from years when I was a kid and off he went to, uh, when he, I think he would end up going to Lincoln when he was uh, 17 or 18. And uh, yeah, so I knew a lot of stories about Mick, and and again, just <laughs> some of them you didn't even believe the truth that 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 unbelievably ridiculous. I mean, how rock hard he was, but the uh, but he didn't spend that much time at Sunderland. I mean, the only time I did see him, he, he did do a tackle on a Coventry player that was six foot high and just kicked his head off virtually. So I think then I did. You live in Thorny Close, don't you? I did. Not now. I'm, li I'm, li I'm living in Washington. Oh, someone's stealing a car. That's quite ironic, that, like... Yeah, I, 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 I've progressed to Washington. Yeah, oh, to the, the, uh, <laughs> That's where I grew Sorry, up. Right. I, can't say, I can't say out about it. So. Sorry. But, yeah, again, so I never really got to see Mick day in, day out right. at, that, at that level. But the guy I did... And and I tell you what, past or present, any hard man you like to mention, I'd put Kevin Ball up against him. Mm -hmm. Barley was just, it's not so much, some of you have met him, I'm sure with Dexter, you've met him, is, mm -hmm. he's the nicest man in the world. He is, absolutely. He is just the most, he's just a gentleman, he's just mm -hmm. a top, top bloke, help anybody, go the extra length, big shake of the hand. Yeah, be careful with the big shake of the hand because he likes to crush it. <laughs> right. So, big shake of the hand and stuff like that. But 
oh my god when he gets up he's just intense and it wasn't just for games it was training mm -hmm. he, you, you'd be wearing people <laughs> the lads would like be wearing the i mean the time when fucking shin pads for because you've trained with bob <laughs> He yeah. was mad, man. He was mad. Yeah. All he thought about, as soon as he, it doesn't matter what line he crossed, it doesn't matter. What, he he was he was intense, and he just mm -hmm. charged around, and he just wanted to kick you. And I mean, just pop up, <laughs> give you one as well. And he loved it. And he roll his sleeves up, and he'd be like, ah, and he, it's just mental. And I've seen him with yeah. uh, John Fashion you I've seen him with every the, uh, the Wimbledon days. He's had them all. He's had them all, and they yeah. shit themselves. And and I just think. Yeah. I think it was rumour that uh, Vinnie Jones was asked a question about who he thought the hardest bloke was he played against. Apparently, he said it was Bolly. Apparently. So, yeah, but, but Bolly, Bolly's not bravado. Bolly just give, doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't give out, doesn't see an out. But you mm -hmm. mess with him. Oh, you've had it. <laughs> you've had it. Anyway, <laughs> cheers. Brilliant. Not a cheers to you. So another, qu another question would be along the same lines. And so, again, the hardest players, hardest managers. Who, would, who, was, who was the hardest out of uh, Butcher and Reid? Because they both had reputations back in the day. Uh, well, I seen Butch when he was at Ipswich, mm -hmm. and he was he was fierce. He was proper fierce, and he, not even just with players with with, with referees. I remember once uh, Butch was playing against David Speedy. Remember mm -hmm. David oh. Speedy, a little yeah, twat? yeah. Uh, uh, and he and he. And he was just winding Butch up. And Butch wasn't happy. And, he, and he, all the decisions were gone against him the first half against him at the, uh, when Ipswich were playing Chelsea at the time. And uh, I was just a young kid. I was 16. And I was I was just stood in the tunnel opposite the uh, referee's room. So you had Ipswich changing room there, referee's room, a bit set back. And then you had the away team dressing room. And Butch just tore out he, the, the being words said in the dressing room. He tore out. Bam, Butch is about six foot five. Mm -hmm. I think he had seven, seven size seven, uh, 12 boots. And he just walked and he banged and banged and banged and banged on the referee's door. And the referee put him up the door. <laughs> he could put his foot through it. He kicked the oh. door down. He, he, he lost yeah. it. And he was, in, he was in the heavy metal and stuff, Butch, man. He was, he was, he was uh, mental. But really had a, I guess that's the little man syndrome. He had this just nasty streak in really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he was. Uh, yeah, you wouldn't mess with really either. So the two of them, I don't know, it's hard hard to differentiate. They had the that the two where mm -hmm. you know, Butch was in your face, and you wouldn't mess with Butch. Mm -hmm. But really, was a nasty fucking one he wanted to be. Yeah, <laughs> but well, both at the top of the game, and that's why sometimes yeah. you have to be so that. And yeah. the, you know, people think it's, this is this is a well, the time was a man sport, and you know, being nice didn't really get you very far. Mm -hmm. no, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. We've got a question coming in from a lad called Paul Morrison. Was asking who was the biggest drinker of the club, and you can't say you. <laughs> uh, but you can. So we, so we had a real drinker school when we when we were going up to uh, where we're in the uh, the championship. We're doing that. So there was mm -hmm. Andy Melva, Phil Greer, me, and Audie. Mm -hmm. So the four of us would be out most of the time. And then that would either get bigger, Mickey Gray to turn up, but Mickey Gray used to get drunk after three pints after carrying around. So, but then it got really serious when Quinny started. Oh, Quinny could drink. Quinny yeah. could drink. I, I mean, I thought I could drink, and I thought Andy Melville could drink. So at the time before Quinny turned up, it was probably me and Mel and, and Phil Gray. So there was about three of us. Mm -hmm. We felt already. Now we're all good fucking drink. We're all part of it. <laughs> but uh, I can... yeah, I think I think Quinny took it to the next level. I, mm -hmm. I think he just filled his legs up. <laughs> oh, Christ, I, I can see. I, I, I'm surprised you said Annie Melville. Like I could see you and Phil Gray and Dickie Orden. I think now, but I didn't think that Melville was that. He was. He seemed a bit more of a refined gent, you know, on the on the field. And that, that is that not the case? He, he's well. No, Mel was great. Uh, Mel was the same on the field as he was off. He was this. Really quiet, mm -hmm. just just a it's just a drip. Sometimes you'd be turned in now. Mel was there, <laughs> but it used to be the same when we meet. Since so we met at one o'clock in the afternoon, it would be two in the morning, and you turn around and Mel look exactly the same as he did when we first met. Oh lord! And he'd had about he'd had about sixteen, eighteen pints. Nah, I can't do that anymore. And that'll be like Jesus, Mel, and. <laughs> 
but he would say, "No, I'm drunk," and he just didn't look us. He just didn't <laughs> didn't look it. <laughs> Which is probably going to be short, but training the next day, you know, but I'm sure that helped him out. So, oh, but, um, the, next day. the worst thing was about training the next day. We turn up on a on a Thursday, and there'd be me, Mel, you know, the four of us, me, Mel, Phil Greer, and Audi, and it was on a Thursday, and that and obviously Rady knew would be now. Rady knew would be now. So virtually Thursday turning up was for about. 40 minutes at the beginning was just running just get the drink out here just just run but before we did as we stood up and just said right just between the four of you keep the ball up between us our record was two <laughs> <laughs> i'd get it bounce it kick it to mel mel would just kick it on the floor oh, one. <laughs> was it. And we just we just honest that's how bad it was on a thursday training in the morning <laughs> keeping up the competition between there was but well, two championship players Two internationals and our record was two for keep you <laughs> so we're, 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 this is the probably the worst segue than talking about how shite you were after you've had a few beers but having <laughs> having made 200 plus career appearances obviously you've faced some fantastic players can you tell us who the best opposing players that you've faced oh jesus uh just trying to think i mean in, in terms of ear player the, 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 you know, I played against Klinsman, I you know, played Cantona, I mean, mm-hmm. but there was one game that sticks out in my mind, and it was an April day playing in the Premier League against Liverpool. Mm-hmm. And uh, me and Audi, we thought, we looked at the looked at the team, we thought, looks like Fowler uh, is playing up front by himself. And I says, I tell you what, I'll man Mark Fowler, you sweep behind. We'll, we'll play like nice and tight, so I'll get right up with Fowler's arse and give me a kick. So I came to the game and they put Fowler and Matt Man- 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 Man played up front. And in the number 10 role, fucking John Barnes played there. Mm. Oh, AMG. <laughs> they I come off at half time. They were 1 0 up. It should have been nine. I sat in the dressing room. Premier Passions could have been there. I didn't even know. I just had, I just had me head in my hands. It was a warm, it was a really warm April day. And I just thought, Get me out of here. I am way over my depth here. These are just off the scale good. John Barnes just did everything one touch. He just got a ping, 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 ping. It was just football off I've never seen. And I was against it. It was just, yeah. So so I give it to the three of them because that was yeah. The, the, yeah, I was tortured. They tortured us, tortured me. The final score that day, do you remember? Two nil. So two one. We came two one. Paul. Two, one, oh, that's right. We got penalty. Did we get penalty? So Stewart scored. I. We uh, they went one nil. It should have been about nine. We kicked off the second half, and within two minutes, I think they scored again. And I tell you what, the sound now. Fowler looked over to Matt Manaman and just went, "We're done." Honest, that the day we're done. They never made another room. Yeah. I just stood next to them. They never did anything. They were two nil, and they just they virtually went. That's it. And then it was all us. We we, we got on and so that. But they, I, 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 had, I had about well, 50, 60 minutes of hell, and then they just mm-hmm. stopped. <laughs> Thought he just had it like a like a boxer, we're just giving up on you. So you guys were punched. Probably, I think I think they felt pity on me. I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so <clears throat> similar to the best opposing player or players, has there ever been a player that you've actually dread facing on the field? You've gone out there and went, oh, shite, I don't want to play against him today. Now, I knew that. I knew yeah. the answer to that. I knew I shouldn't even ask you the question. I shouldn't really. I Again, just, massively I, I, violent. So, yeah, I loved, <laughs> I just loved the challenge. I, I, mm-hmm. If they were hard, if they were meant to be this and that, I just wanted, I just wanted to play. <laughs> but the only thing is, as you say, you know, that wasn't the fastest. So, so any any player that was fast, which is probably every forward I played, played against, it was only with only dread. But <laughs> but generally, no. I just, I used yeah. to just think, right. I just wanted, I just wanted to see how I'd fare against them. I just wanted to play against mm-hmm. them, and I'd seen them on the telly millions of times, especially when it was the Premier League, and I just wanted to say, come on, let let's have it. And at times, you know, at, at times they, they were they were good players and stuff. But but generally, when that Premier League and I played against players out it was it was great because i just thought do you know what you know you know you know all that <laughs> but again it's just it's just one of them where you just wanted to compete with them these are the best in the world and you just wanted to compete but uh no not not really not not that not anybody not anybody 
Let's, let's, let's talk about uh, stadium, football grounds. Where's the best grounds and worst grounds that you've been to as a player or as a fan? So when I first started my career at, uh, in Ipswich, we used to play, obviously, in the, the Southern Counties. So the Southern Counties are the other London clubs. Uh, and the likes of Colchester as well were in that. But we used to have a, what was called the Floodlit Cup. And with them, in the Floodlit Cup, you could play at the grounds. It was a prop, and I remember as a kid, I was 16, uh, and I was obviously playing on the only 18 league, and we turned up in the Floodlit Cup quarterfinals daily, and that was playing just to sell for us. Uh, Merce was playing for them. Uh, there was a couple of, uh, a couple of the lads who played up, think of the name for us. But we turned up and it was Highbury. Mm -hmm. And Highbury, you just going through the big doors, big, the massive wooden doors as a player's eminence, and it was just marble with this big sweep and staircase. Come, come on. There was uh, a bust of uh, Chapman, there was the old, the old chairman years ago, and then you just walked down this. It was just so grand. And you mm -hmm. got in, and the, and the changing rooms were gigantic. Man, bear in mind, you know, I'm just used to school changing rooms or changing in the car. This mm -hmm. was just, you know, individual baths, individual showers. The floor was heated. I was like, fuck okay, you know, this is amazing. <laughs> and then you go through the tunnel and the pitch was like a carpet. Mm -hmm. I just was like, wow, 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 wow. And I've always had this soft spot. Unfortunately, it's gone, but I just, I just, just loved hybrid. And then what about the worst, worst place? Yeah. The worst, Kenilworth Road, Luton. Mm -hmm. It's a shithole. <laughs> oh, it is. And not only is it a shithole, it's trying to get there is a nightmare. It's just in the middle of loads of streets and stuff. Mm -hmm. You get there, and actually, when we got on the pitch, the pitch actually stunk of sewage. Oh, oh, oh Lord. Honest, it was stinking. I did score that day, but, but that's all I remember. <laughs> I but remember being down in, there. It, yeah, it, stinking. It, you almost... You almost have to go through someone's yard to get into the ground. It's really weird. It's like you're walking through yes. someone's backyard. It's crackers like so. All right, so here, here's the uh, hot topic. That, and I have to ask you, I know that you currently uh, do some work for the club, but um, we we'll talk about Sunderland, the current situation right now. But we're, we're, is there any of the players that in the Sunderland squad that you actually enjoy watching right now? Well, not right now, but this past season. It's fucking hard, isn't it? It is. It is hard. My language, but it is hard. It is hard watching them at the minute. Mm -hmm. uh, I love just when you see when you're not actually, I, I love the club, but I just find it. I mean, at the moment, I don't know. Especially the Jack Ross. I don't. I might upset, but he was fucking useless. I, I just didn't get Jack Ross um, yeah. ever, and his and his tactics. I just 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 hated them. But so, but towards the end of this last season stuff. Uh, Willis was was mm -hmm. coming along strong. Mm -hmm. I think he's a he's a good lad, and I think mm -hmm. he, he quick. He's aggressive, so for me, he's a decent player. Looks like mm -hmm. Bailey Wright's going to be you know, yeah. alongside him again. I think that's a good sign. And the Aussies mm -hmm. again, the Aussie, I think he's going to be quite competitive, and mm -hmm. it'll be. I think it'll be a good sign. And I, I've got, I've got a soft spot for Maguire because when he's on form, I think he's he's a top player. Scores mm -hmm. good goals, creates goals. So mm -hmm. so that's probably me three at the minute. Mm -hmm. No, that's fair but, enough. Uh, yeah, but it's tough. I think it's, it's still a tough watch. Mm -hmm. What about your opinion of the current state of the club then? <laughs> I think, <laughs> all right. I think, I think we could all have an opinion and it'll all be rough oh. through this year. It's, uh, I'd like to think it's organised chaos, but I think that even that's wishful thinking. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a mess. It's a mess. Yeah. We have no idea who's running the club. It seems yeah. to be good signings and then you get, you know, like we all do, we're all social media. Is it is it is it Stuart Donald behind the scenes? Is it somebody else? What's happening? Who's in what? Who's where? It's uh, I mean I, I, I see I see Gary Bennett. I seen him seen I seen him a couple of days last week. I was talking to Gary. Obviously he, he talks. He's in with Bob on the club and there's uh, and he's got uh, lads he speaks to. He doesn't really have a clue. I, mm -hmm. I, I, I ping uh, Jim Montgomery every now and again. You know, we all talk to each other. We nobody knows. Nobody knows. So, and again, when you see that this social media, good source, mm -hmm. eh? HP is a good source, but I don't know anybody else who's uh, got any. Uh, I haven't a clue. Don't know, but at the minute, mate, it's it's not good, is it? It's not good. Uh, no, it's not. And there's a lot of things that need putting right as well from on all all avenues. And the communication's been, uh, well, it's been sacked off, and it really is. So there's nothing really coming out of the club, and it's uh, it's just been 
very disappointing the past few years. And as I said, it's yeah. just we've. I, I'm gonna say, I can't say we. I think there's been people that have, have, have dug their own graves really in there. To be honest with you, so. But anyway, yeah. we've I think sorry for some of the lads. There's like Chris Waters and and, and the lads who work yeah. behind the scenes on it. Yeah. They love the club. They just want everything, yeah. and to just and they just look up and go. It's, the, yeah. it's them. You know what I mean? They just it just didn't get any support to. Because it could be well, we all know it could be just the greatest club in, in the world. It's just, it's just, yeah. just, it's just, it's just could be the best. I'm going to support what you said there as well, Lee. I mean, I've, I've been very fortunate to do different things with the club, and I've met a lot of the staff that work there. And there's not one person that I've met there that ha one haven't been professional, or two love the club. They absolutely yeah. adore working for the club. They love it, and they're there for the right reason. I mean, you're talking for every, every you know, from security. Uh, all the way through to the people that are working and giving out, you know, serving beers and stuff like that. They're just, you know, I mean, I know that's deteriorated too because they've obviously shut a lot of stuff down, but it, it's hard for them to be in the face of, or, or be the, sorry, forward facing people each week dealing with the fans, you know. And then, as you said, the people that are making the decisions aren't necessarily the ones that are on the front line. So you mentioned yeah. Chris Waters there, absolutely sublime, sublime bloke, superb. Um, and, and again, he, sh he should be. I know. I know he's just been returned from furlough as well, so he should be put on a pedestal because he's absolutely superb. I mean, he is the heart and soul of that club. Uh, anyway, big great. Man. Yep. Right. What's the best advice you were ever given as a player? I thought about this long and hard. You know, in, in terms of, and I, and I haven't really, really. But you know, when you think about who said what, where. But I do remember once me, me dad on. You know, Gone to the match, and I think we'd, we'd, we'd been somewhere and we're getting beat. And uh, I don't know, I was playing up front or so far. I, I think we were, talking, we were arguing about, you know, he was upset about somebody. And and he just said to us, and I suppose it was just an off he went, If you give 100%, you give everything. You give everything if you're on that park, but it doesn't matter who you're playing for. If you just give 100% commitment, mm -hmm. but you can be shit, you can be crap, you know, you'd rather get. And nobody then can question you. Nobody can say, "Well, you're not trying." Mm -hmm. And I think that's 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 probably what stuck with us all my life is. I might have a bad game, but you can never ever tell me that I never tried. And I think, mm -hmm. yeah, and, it's, and that gets to one of the few players out they're not even trying. Look at them; they're not even bothered. Yeah, yeah. I don't. Nobody's ever told me that, and I just yeah. and that's probably what I'm more proud of. Anything is just, you know, it doesn't matter how bad I was or how average I was. I'd, I'd be, <laughs> I uh, yeah yeah I, I I I nobody could ever question me commitment. Who, who decided you average then? Because I mean, he said like massively violent, decidedly average. Who, who decided you average? Was it you? No, it, it was. Uh, uh, I was. It was a big. It was the Premier Passions. We're talking about it. It was the reunion. It was twenty years, mm -hmm. and I went and I went to uh, Adu, and everybody was there. Reedy and Sakor and uh, Quinny and I mean the list. It was about ten of the lads there, ten of the players there, and. Uh, and the compare at the time was going through, you know, this one's done this, this one, England and the national, you know, Niall Quinn, you know, shit house, you know, never done anything for the club. No, quite the, quite the opposite. <laughs> but, uh, and they went, uh, Lee Howie, uh, massively violent, decidedly average. And everybody started pissing themselves laughing. That's, and, it's brilliant. And I, was, I was, and I was virtually in about chapter three of my book. <laughs> And ne and I didn't really want to know what to call it, mm -hmm. and I just thought that'll do. And do you know what? To be decidedly average and play my games for some and stuff, I'll take I'll mm -hmm. take average. Don't want to be mm -hmm. shit. And yeah, you know, I wish I was better. <laughs> but 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 do you know what? That's who I was. I, I, I'm mm -hmm. not. I, I don't. Yeah. You know, again, like you just said, I scored goals. I've enjoyed myself and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've done which. Thousands and thousands and thousands of other men mm -hmm. would just die for. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, I'm it's, quite, see, I'm quite it's, happy to be average. It's that mindset there. So basically, we've got a question here from Graham Pritchard in Arizona. He's put on there. Do you have any regrets in your career? And he did actually point out after that mind. It doesn't sound like it. So any regrets? No, I, I wish. I wish I wasn't as anxious. I wish I could have got hold of them nerves. And I suppose. You know, in modern day football, I'd have had some freaking specialist and psychologist to help me. Uh, but I had to deal with them myself, which I found difficult. So maybe if I'd been able to manage that, then maybe I, I, I wouldn't. Have, I would have been a bit better than average. But 
Uh, but the book would have sounded okay. shit though. Yeah, it'd be no. massively, <laughs> massively violent and a bit better than average. That would a bit better than average. Good. No, no, no. But again, <laughs> I, you can't have regrets. It's it's just impossible in life. You know, you yeah. make decisions, things happen. So yeah. what? You know what I mean? You just you just get on with it. You know, thing things happen for a reason. And mm -hmm. and no, yeah. How can I regret ever playing for Son of Football Club? It's impossible. Love it. So what's your proudest moment as a footballer? It's going to be playing for Sunderland Football Club. What's your proudest moment? Signing for them. Can you imagine growing up and all your life is up to sign about you know, signing for England, or playing for England. Yeah. That never, ever crossed my mind. All I wanted to do was play for something. Mm -hmm. Ever. From, from, as, as, from, as, from as young as I can, you know, I can imagine. I was, I was probably three-year-old when someone won the FA Cup in 73. Three, four-year-old. And I've got a vague memory of that. And I remember my dad taking me to the football matches. And I remember just being Sunderland daft, the football strips, you know, pretending I'm Gary Rowe, pretending I'm, you know, just <laughs> loved, loved the club. So to get and sign that, and as I say, I signed for less money than I was actually getting, but I didn't care. I wasn't bothered. All I wanted to do was play for some. So that to me Brilliant. is the, the most proudest moment. So what, do you, what was your biggest accomplishment in football? Has to be playing the prayer. Yeah, you know, just just a just a handful of games, but them handful of games you're playing against the best players in the world, mm -hmm. and and just have that. It, it, again, sometimes I'm at work and I think about it, and sometimes my mind, you know, wanders a bit. And I and it seems many many years ago, and it does. It seems a different lifetime. I go, oh, can hell, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did that. I did that. Yeah, yeah, I did that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was me. Yeah, yeah, that was me. That was me. <laughs> Was there anyone so else that you, was anyone that you thought about playing for? I mean, other than Sunderland, well, there's only one team because I uh, obviously, well, at the time I'm Sally Eden's lad, you know, old Catholic school, and and uh, and my auntie married a, a mad Celtic fan. And when I was a kid, my summer holidays was to watch Celtic uh, pre-season games. So we'd go up and you know watch his. Mm -hmm. His cousins and, and and stuff play on that freaking asphalt thing, sliding tackles. I was amazed, fucking mad Scottish people, yeah. But uh, yeah, I used to I used to go up and watch the Saturday games and just see their park and and I've been to a few games up there and just to see sixty thousand and the noise and stuff. I think mm -hmm. yeah, that, that probably is, if 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 there's a, uh, I would probably put Sutton and Straw Celtic as just probably is one of the best. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I've been to. Uh, I went to Rangers, I went to Ibrox and watched the uh, Champions League game there, but I didn't even touch what I'd seen at Celtic. And I was mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough not so long ago to watch Celtic versus Barcelona. I went up there to watch that game. The atmosphere, that was just, it was unreal. Unreal. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, that, so. Actually, the lad who asked the question about regrets, Graham Pritchard, he's a massive Celtic supporter as well. So, And he claims he isn't Scottish, but he is. He's a liar. Anyway, who was the... Who was the <laughs> It was the biggest joke you've met in football and why? They're all fucking mad anyway, <laughs> most of them. But uh, yeah, I, I think on my son and days it had to be Ori. Mm -hmm. Because he was mental. I mean, like, he's got a screw loose, the lad. You just think some of the stuff he says, you just, you, he shouldn't be allowed. <laughs> he should be arrested and, and tugged down. But uh, yeah, and to be fair, and if, I mean, it was the old school stuff. You got on the changing room. If you got the other side of Audi and he was on your case, you, you had it because he used to just rip you. But he was funny with it and you just couldn't yeah. help it. And obviously, I was his roomie for, for a long time and, and I, I, he just had me crying. More, more out of stuff he'd see. And I don't know, I don't know I'm being sure if he thought he was funny, but he was just mental. But we just loved his mm -hmm. stories and now he carried on and he was always life and soul of the party and just, just, just made our life just joyous. And the other one that made me laugh was Mickey Greer, but we just used to laugh at him <laughs> because he was so thick. He just couldn't be, you know, I think he could tie his shoelaces until he was 25. <laughs> I but mentioned I went about, on, yeah. Sorry, sorry, go on. No, go on, go on, sorry. No, and then when I went to where uh, Bernie Glenn Little was a, was a right. real confident, funny lad, really mm -hmm. good crack. You know, he, he was a Crystal Palace as a, as a young man and he was, uh, uh, 
that that team, you know, in terms of he used to pick up Pardew and Southgate and uh, and, and uh, Ian Wright was there at the time, and he had a few good stories, and he was good. He was funny. He was a funny lad as well. I would mention this uh, Stewie the other week about uh, Mickey Gray and that consortium, and uh, Stewie nearly fell off his chair. Might not want to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, there's no way. So anyway. Um, no, Mickey, Mickey's, Mickey's probably thought, do you know what, if I get, a, get together about 60 quid, I should be all right. <laughs> I was going to say, you mentioned Dickie Ord there. He's a proper Merton lad. And oh. uh, I mean, I, I can tell you some stories. Well, my dad, uh, who you know, he uh, beat him in an arm wrestling competition at Haggerston Castle. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's the kind of lad he is. He just he just you know, gets on with stuff. So, And uh, like you said, no, there's no, um, no say airs and graces. He's just a proper lad. So, well, which is nice if you ever say. do this, if you ever do this with audio, you'll have to make it off to do within the Hetton Club because that's where he is now. Kind of get him oh, out of there. Christ, Christ. <laughs> right. He, he's, he's my favourite bit here. So, what was your favourite chant or song that you heard from the supporters or in the stands? Well, me, I've got a shit memory, but the only one I really enjoy now singing when I when I watch the lads is uh, Alan Shearer is a wanker. He went <laughs> to hand, so, so that's what, but yeah, he a So I really enjoy singing that one. Yeah, uh, I used to love at the time singing. Uh, uh, oh, I've just got to be mind, so I'm just singing it now. Uh, fuck them all, fuck them all. I just like that one, Mickey Grace one. So I used to like that one. And again, anything that slags the mags off, I'm, 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 I'm all there. I'm all over that one. So you, you, you know where I'm going with this. Anyway, yeah, it's obviously yeah. a leading question yeah. to the uh, infamous Lee Howie, Lee Howie, Lee Howie song. Can you tell uh, the folks at home how you when you first heard it? Well, or you didn't hear it. I've actually got oh, get it. My t-shirt on. <laughs> Brilliant. I, I wear it every day. <laughs> it's a nice memory. I uh, no, I was warming up in '94, probably. It probably been '94, and I think Brian Atkins was there. And I just heard Leo, Leo, and I just thought, I just put my hand up, didn't really hear. And I just turned around and Brian Atkinson was pissing himself, laughing. And I went, what? And he went, listen, listen. And then it was Leo, Leo, your brother is a cunt. And I just put two <laughs> thumbs up. And then it just got louder and louder and louder and louder. And <laughs> even though I can go to games now, it was only, only last year, I was at Rochdale away. Mm -hmm. And he had me cap on. And uh, I'm just having a, I was having a beer underneath the uh, fucking shit hole, another one. Watch the other <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was having a beer with plastic glass, and uh, and then I was just just sat down. It's just it was, I was only by myself. My son was gone, gone to the loo or something, and then they just started Leo, 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 <laughs> and and blokes behind us who went, Jesus, that's been going on for years, you know. Jesus, uh, uh, these some of these kids are not even gnarly. I mean, I was stood there, I was just about to turn around when. Just let me cap up and get it, but I just thought I just keep myself un under wraps. But he, uh, yeah, it still goes. It still goes. Mm -hmm. People still sing it. It's it's a good job. It's simple. I think that's what it is. It's nice <laughs> and simple and catchy. So is it is it accurate or what? He's a fucking cunt. Sorry about that, but he is. Uh, <laughs> that will be yeah. interesting. So yeah, um, <laughs> I don't like him. I don't like him at all. We we, we uh, don't get on. I have a, a similar affliction, unfortunately. So uh, not with your brother, with mine. <laughs> um, Stephen Mayhem, and I'm not sure if you remembered him. I think you met him in Toronto. He actually lives in Atlanta. Uh, right. He's actually sent, he's sent his regards, and he's asked if uh, asked about if I can ask you if you could tell us a story about the song still haunting your brother when he was in Africa. Oh, <laughs> I say that. <laughs> yeah, he because uh, he's all you know, hoity toity with the Premier League and uh, and Sky Sports as he gets there. So he. They, they were doing some sort of uh, extending the Premier League and, and, and Sky Sports, and he had to go to Nigeria. Uh, so off he went to Nigeria, and I think it was uh, it was Lampard was on there, uh, uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Redknapp, Fernand, and mm -hmm. Jimmy Carragher, and I was Stephen on this mm -hmm. went over to so so they went on this you know, nice posh minibus. So they pulls up to this hotel, but the, this hotel is, is virtually gated. It's it's all fence round. It's really posh hotel, and at the and at the gate, there's uh, five guards, and they're all got guns. So the, the gates are down, so they're all chatting, and uh, 
and I suppose a big Nigerian guy turns up, puts his head through the window and just says, passports or papers. And so they're all hand them in. So he's looking at the passport. He's checking everybody out, checking everybody out, checking everybody out. He's quite happy. He hands all the passports back. And then he just just waves to the guy to lift lift the lift the lift the barriers. And as he and as they're just about to start, he just taps out the window and he goes, Leo 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 That's brilliant. And everybody's laughing and he and now Stephen looks at everybody and goes, Fucking Nigeria. <laughs> Wait, I, I tell you what, I, I think I mentioned to you, I had um, Ruben Agbola on here, and there's, a, there's, there's quite a following um, in Nigeria, there's a lad called Nelson uh, that uh, actually mm. runs a supporters group out there. I mean, he might have known about that. That's absolutely superb, that. He couldn't escape it thousands of miles no, away. It, it and he hates it, it, and that's why I love it, is it doesn't matter <laughs> where he goes in the world. Yeah. I mean, in the yeah. world. When he says he's Steve Howie, they yeah. all say, Lee Howie, Lee Howie, Lee Howie. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely brilliant. Uh, so, it, just makes, it just makes my life. That just, <laughs> he, he has the pain every day. <laughs> well, some some deserve it. So, how how would you describe Sullen fans in three words? Uh, first one has to be passionate. I mean, they they are the you know just the life and soul of of, of the club. That's it. The passion. And loyal, the shit that we've had to go through over these years. And there's not, I mean, you can see a Man City and you can talk about the Royal de Mags. There's not many teams in the world that can be playing in the third tier of football and turn out 46,000 fans. Yeah. There's, mm -hmm. no, there's no way about it. So, so loyal is one. And I, I will pinch a other word. The, the, the best. The best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it for me. Of course, we yeah, love that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is something I've tried to explain to you know to the lads who we've had on here about what it's like to try and no, it's not even we don't really have to try very hard. It's actually you know, recruit um, Americans uh, to support yeah. someone. I think the difference being is you, you mentioned that passion, and I mentioned this a, a few weeks back that when we were in a pub and we we're watching the game, obviously we're on edge. We know our stuff. You know, we, we basically know who's playing where and, and, yeah. and have the history of the club. And then, as I said, we've got the, we're just up there singing and it, it does attract people that anybody who's, who has a genuine interest in following football, they're looking for a connection. And that connection yeah. typically comes comes in a way where you separate yourself from other people. And, and you're absolutely right. There's those three things there certainly help us recruit. And I think that the vast majority of our um, fan base now, especially involved in the Sons of Liberty supporters group, you know, the, the majority of them now are actually American born. Uh, yeah. which is just superb so again to see the passion that we have but even though we're in you know where we are where we are but we still get to see it on the SAFC and so yes, it's, uh, it's, yeah, so it, it, it makes a difference it makes all the difference and it, and so you know it don't sound uh, come by our but I certainly appreciate the efforts that the lads and lasses put in over here um, because it is difficult and to, and to keep motivated and uh, keep people engaged again that's why we've been doing these as well yeah. is to actually keep people engaged in the club Give him some history and understand why we fell in love with with someone. So no, and you, you think Dexy, you, you get all the players. To, players are willing. To, we just love the players. It's just, it's just, especially the, you know, you have got Paul Stewart and you know England international. You know, all of a sudden, mm -hmm. the the people that's been involved with Sunderland know what it means to the fans, and yeah, and it's great. Like, and again, especially old school footballers, they're willing to just give give mm -hmm. the time just to. Just to you know, remember the stuff that we used to do and have a bit of a laugh because the world were great days, great days. <laughs> no, we, we many more to come. This is a fan. I want more to come. I want, I want, yeah, good, good days. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. So, how, how would you sum up your time, your entire time at Sunderland? How would you, how, how would you sum it up overall? I mean, I, I mean, if you, if I look back, which I have to, okay, and if I can remember, <laughs> just a huge sense of pride, Exy. Just mm -hmm. I did it, you know. If I look at you, you said when you just talked about it, I did it. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I got up one morning and I was a Sunderland player. <laughs> Can't get any better than that. <laughs> you know, and, and, and what and what came about and what happened, the ups and the downs and you know, all the relegation and you know, waking up in a cold sweat, fucking having a nightmare about Wimbledon and stuff. And but I was there. I did yeah. it. I was at Roper Park and I, I did. I did. I just fulfilled me dream. And mm -hmm. that, that 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 is it. It's just a, a huge sense of pride. Huge sense of pride. Brilliant, good man. What was your funniest moment as a Sunderland player? 
Oh, there's loads, but the, the, there is one that sticks out, which which just sums up Sunderland Football Club. We were in the Premier League, and we we hired this supposedly top physio from Darlington, but he was he came highly recommended by the called Nigel Carnell. So, and Nigel was about the shyest man you'd ever want to meet, and. He was so quietly spoken. And then when, you wouldn't believe this. So when we were on TV in the Premier League, he wouldn't run on the pitch if somebody was injured. He was too shy. Okay. Only okay. someone could involve a physio <laughs> that wouldn't come on the pitch. Right. So what did he so, have to do then? So so we had this guy called Gordon Ellis. I don't know if you've met God. Gordon's a funny lad. So God, Gordon worked for Durham, Durham Jail. He was, right. a, he was he was he was a prison guard, uh, but he passed his physio stuff and so far. So he used to come in on a part time basis, just to help out. He loved the club. He just wanted to be involved. And Gordon was a good lad. He used to come out drinking with us and so far. So Gordon was on Gordon was on the bench today, and I think we might have played Spurs or I can't remember who it was. Anyway, so we stood there. Kevin Ball gets injured, so he's down. He's in the middle of the park. I mean, virtually right in the centre circle. He's in there, so. They went, Nigel, get on. Ball is injured. No, I'm not going <laughs> Get on. I'm not going So, so have to put, Ball is injured. Get on the pitch. He went, no, I'm not going on. I cannot, I cannot, I cannot. So, really turns around and went, go on. Get on. And bear in mind, I think it was the it was the August or early September. And I'm red or dear. Red or dear. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Gordon runs on and he's got a big bench court on. And he's, and he's running on. And he's lifting it over and he's putting it over his head <laughs> and he's running on. This is in the Premier League, by the way. He's <laughs> running on the Premier League with this court over his head. He's with Barley and he's trying to trade Barley with his stuff. And then we're all stood around going, Gordon, Gordon, what the fucking hell are you doing? <laughs> he went, if the cameras get me, I'm fucked. I'm on the sick at work. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good Lord. <laughs> He was off sick. He'd have to run yeah. on. For, oh man, that just went typical <laughs> stuntman. That's what I think. Oh, that's class. <laughs> so I hope some of the American you... people understand what the sick is and stuff. So I, I couldn't even translate it. Now, basically, the, yeah, they do understand it on, on the sick. Good. Um, Good. So, it, me, obviously, I, I took up a lot of your time already. We're over an hour and a half in. I'm not trying to get rid of you now. But is there anything else that you want to share before we we close it down? No, it, just one thing. Just keep the faith as we do. That's it. We, we there should be good times, hopefully ahead, and that's 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 what we dream about. So, yeah, thanks for this. Thanks for the invite, Daisy. Thanks oh, for like. being in touch, and thanks for everybody that's tuned in. But we'll keep the faith. Absolutely. So, before we end the show, we do have a quiz, quiz question for a signed copy of Lee's book. The question is: Which team did Howie score his first goal against for Sunderland? That's which team did Howie score his first? You can't answer your question. <laughs> I'm putting that. Uh, which team he scored his first goal against for Sunderland? Send the answer to Sons of Liberty SAFC at gmail.com. That's Sons of Liberty SAFC at gmail.com. Uh, I'd like to take this opportunity again to thank Lee for his time and his service to the club. Don't forget, he hasn't asked me to do this, but don't forget you can purchase his book, Massively Violent, Decidedly Average on Amazon. It's a superb read, you will not be disappointed. Uh, also, next Saturday, we'll have former Sunland winger and old team uh, old roommate of howie's jimmy lawrence in the studio with Come us on, jimmy jimmy yeah and also we are recording the second edition of via football and bollocks next week which will also feature a former sunland and current el paso locomotive player richie ryan and up on the a lad who has had more clubs than jack nicklaus basically um and that's it really so lee thanks very much for your time i really appreciate yeah, it look, thanks totally everyone enjoy for it. In. Really and, and again, I appreciate it, mate. Until then, stay healthy, stay safe, keep the faith. Thanks very much, lads. Take care. Cheers, everybody. Cheers, Lee. Thanks, bye. Bye.